Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again. Today I want to present the seventh lecture in my series on the selected gross pathology of the skin. We're going to talk about a problem in our companion animal species, much of which we know about largely from human medicine, and those are the immune mediated diseases. Before I start, as always, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who provided me such fantastic images over the years, which allow me to put these lectures together. Well, let's start with the most common form of pemphigus that we see in dogs, and this is pemphigus foliaceus. This form of pemphigus also resembles pemphigus erythematosus, although the cases of erythematosus are generally more mild in nature. This is a very typical appearance of pemphigus foliaceus with pustules and crusting of the face, especially of the nasal planum, the ears. You can also see it on the foot pads, the beds of the claws, and the groin. And the lesions are usually bilaterally symmetrical. Histologically, you see the formation of pustules or accumulation of degenerate neutrophils within the stratum corneum, which often contains detached stratum corneum cells known as acanthocytes. As these pustules rupture, they form these thick crusts. And your major differential from this is going to be a chronic bacterial infection. In pemphigus, the body directs autoantibodies against various components in the desmosomes or hemidesmosomes. The desmosomes are what keep the epithelial cells attached to each other, and the hemidesmosomes are the ones that keep the entire epidermis anchored to the underlying basement membrane. In pemphigus foliaceus, the major autoantigen in dogs is against Desmocolin 1, which is a transmembrane calcium dependent desmosomal glycoprotein. Here, the disease is a little different from the one that's seen in humans, in which the target compound in desmosomes is desmoglein 1. The fact that the target protein is a component of the desmosomes means that we have a separation within the epidermis as the epidermal cells start to come apart, as opposed to other immune mediated diseases in which targets against the hemidesmosomes cause the entire epidermis to come off, which we'll see shortly. This disease primarily attacks haired skin, it's usually seen in middle-aged dogs with no sex predilection, and there's a genetic predisposition for a number of breeds, including Akitas, Dobermans, Chows, Spitz, Sharpays, and a couple of others. Uh, it may have a predisposing cause or not. Spontaneous uh, conditions are usually seen in Akitas, and chows, whereas Dobermans and Labradors may have drug-induced disease. And then some dogs will develop it after a prolonged course of chronic allergic or pruritic skin disease. As I previously stated, uh, Pemphigus erythematosus is a very similar disease in appearance, but the lesions are more mild. I have left off describing pemphigus vulgaris, a disease in which autoantibodies are formed against desmoglein 3 in the hemidesmosome because that primarily affects mucous membranes, resulting in ulcerative stomatitis, proctitis, vaginitis, and rarely dermatitis, but most of the lesions are concentrated on the mucous membranes rather than the skin. Pemphigus foliaceus is also the most common autoimmune disease in the horse. In the horse, you can see lesions in the coronary band and some 
are strictly relegated to the coronary band, but you may also see it on the face, the limbs, or ultimately it can become generalized. About 50% of the animals have concurrent systemic clinical signs, and certain breeds of horses, such as Appaloosas, may be predisposed. Unfortunately, horses offer, often founder during treatment, which makes this a very serious condition in the horse. Another type of autoimmune disease of the epidermis, which we referred to earlier, is bullous pemphigoid. Bullous pemphigoid is an autoimmune disease in which the target compound is a antigen within the hemidesmosome, which connects the epidermis to the underlying basement membrane. And so when you have this disease, separation takes place within the lamina lucida of the basement membrane and the entire epidermis lifts off. This is bullous pemphigoid in a Yucatan mini pig in this fantastic picture. You can see the large blistering here. Uh, Yucatan mini pigs don't have a whole lot of hair. So we're looking at the pig itself. The head is this way, tail is this way, and you can see these big blisters. There's not much you can do for these animals. Um, this is zinc oxide cream, and it was washed off enough and carefully enough that we can see the large blisters. These blisters uh, and the area underneath them, between them and the uh, basement membrane, because the epidermis forms the roof of the blisters, and underneath is the basement membrane, are filled with the eosinophils, because that's a very uh, unique way that pigs tend to uh, uh, react to inflammatory changes. They often send a lot of eosinophils, especially in skin conditions. Um, all of these conditions, all the bulls pemphigoid, you can do specialized testing, which will demonstrate the presence of antibodies, especially IgG, on the target areas here along the basement membrane and within the stratum corneum in the pustules in pemphigus foliaceus. Another autoimmune disease in this great picture by Dr. Fabrizio Grandi is hereditary epidermolysis bullosa. One of the main characteristics of this disease is that it's congenital. It's an autoimmune disease that affects puppies between birth and two months of age, whereas most of the other diseases are usually seen in middle age. Epidermolysis bullosa is a condition in which the blisters arise as a result of very minor trauma. And you can see them on the skin, you can see them on the inside of the mouth. And it's probably the result of mutation of a number of genes. The ones that have been identified uh, are in the COLA A7 uh, family, which encode for collagen in the skin or mucosa. Remember the COLA A1s? Uh, encode for collagen in bone and osteonectin and result in uh, osteogenesis imperfecta. So this is a somewhat related disease uh, which affects the collagen in the skin and the mouth, giving rise to these ulcers. We move on to another subset of immune-mediated diseases. We should talk about lupus erythematosus. And lupus is a spectrum of inflammatory diseases that vary from mild skin limited to conditions to life-threatening systemic disease in which autoantibodies are launched against a wide variety of normal body substances. I'm not going to discuss systemic lupus here, which is seen in dogs and cats and horses uh, and some other species. Um, and we're going to primarily focus on cutaneous manifestations, which are referred to as cutaneous lupus erythematosus. In these cases, you may have systemic involvement. You often only have the cutaneous involvement. 
This is probably the most commonly diagnosed autoimmune skin disease in the dog. And just because you have the skin lesions doesn't mean that the animal will eventually develop the full-blown systemic lupus condition. There are a number of different types of uh, cutaneous or discoid lupus, and they are often breed-related. Chinese crested dogs and spits have a disseminated discoid lupus erythematosus. German short-haired pointers have an exfoliative version. Collies and sheepdogs have a vesicular version, and German shepherds have a mucocutaneous version. There are a number of other breeds of dogs which just spontaneously appear to develop the disease, and it's been seen in cats too. The basic pathogenesis is a failure of mechanisms that maintain B and T cell self-tolerance. Regulatory T cells response is usually markedly reduced or absent, so the body can generate immunoreactive, immunoreactivity against its own components. There are a number of triggers, uh, including UV light or drugs or infectious agents. Grossly, the skin lesions may be extremely variable, but they often affect the sparsely haired areas of the face, especially the nose and the lips and the tips of the ears. But they may also be seen on the thorax and the abdomen. Light microscopic findings are characteristic and you see a combination of lichenoid or interface dermatitis, an aggregation of lymphocytes primarily at the, the dermoepidermal junction, which gives it sort of a fuzzy appearance. There's often a hydropic degeneration of basal epithelium and apoptosis, uh, little hyperchromatic cells scattered through the basal epithelium, which are referred to as savate bodies. And really severe cases may result in bulla formation between the epidermis and the dermis with vacuoles underneath the epidermis. This condition has long been diagnosis, discoid lupus erythematosus in collies. Photosensitive nasal dermatitis may be a better term, once again UV light being a trigger for the development of this condition. Uh, many of these cases may also represent a form of mucocutaneous pyoderma, which has very similar signs at the basal layers. Another place that may be affected in lupus erythematosus is at the nail beds. This condition has been referred to as lupoid onychodystrophy in this great picture by Donald O'Toole. It's probably, rather than being an onychodystrophy, a lupoid onychitis is probably a better term since this is an inflammatory lesion. Most of the, most of the uh, uh, cases that are seen are idiopathic, but it's been reported that it may be an adverse drug reaction. Well, we've seen a number of cases. They're often very uh, frustrating to deal with because what will happen is the animal will lose the claw and you will get the submission of the claw, the claw just being the keratin um, that covers the end of the foot here and unless you have the ability to evaluate the germinal epithelium for inflammatory tissues you're not going to really get to a diagnosis you may have a clinical suspicion based on the gross photographs but you have to have the uh, nail bed epithelium and usually people don't want to amputate the uh, uh, the toe in hopes that the claw is going to grow back Generally, if they grow back, they are wrinkled and distorted, just like this. Okay, let's look at a, another autoimmune skin disease. Um, this one is very difficult to tell from the others, and if you said that this was a severe case of pemphigus, uh, 
foliaceous, I don't think I would disagree with you. Um, but on biopsy, it is going to be significantly different. This is erythema multiforme. It's a one of a range of uh, autoimmune diseases. The most severe condition is known as toxic epidermal necrolysis. They're often related to uh, previous drug administrations. Um, and they result in the formation of these really erythematous encrusted lesions. Uh, they have a targetoid appearance over the entire body, but they're most often seen in the abdominal area. It can be seen in association with drugs, with changes in the diet or vaccines as well. One of the keys to the histologic diagnosis is the presence of those hyperchromatic nuclei of apoptotic cells. But unlike uh, in lupus, they're not just restricted to the basal epithelium. In erythema multiforme, you can have necrotic cells all the way from the basal epithelium up through the stratum spongiosum uh, in essentially all layers of the epidermis. Toxic epidermal necrolysis is a condition very similar, which you can have massive necrosis, and if you push on the skin, it will just detach. It is considered a spectrum of disease and probably the most severe manifestation of this autoimmune phenomenon. Sometimes the autoimmune disease focuses on the vessels. Dermatomyositis is a well-known disease of Collies and Shelties, which is a vasculitis within the dermis. Um, it's one of a number of vasculopathies in which the inflammation is minimal, but the vasculitis and the loss of blood supply results in ischemia to the overlying skin elements and muscles. So these animals will have atrophy of the facial muscles and severe follicular atrophy. Another manifestation of a vasculopathy, which causes atrophy of the overlying elements, is well known to most practitioners. When I was in practice, um, this would be the result of a normal rabies vaccination, which resulted in an ischemic change in the skin, a vasculitis underneath. The animals would lose their hair. The, the, uh, the, thin would become, the skin would become very thin and hyperpigmented, um, and it always seemed to happen on white poodles. And uh, we would call this poodle patch, and uh, it's just an adverse immune-driven reaction um, to vaccine, which centers on a cell-poor vasculitis. Cats have a very similar syndrome, which is referred to as feline ulcerative dermatitis syndrome. The exact cause is unknown, but it's thought it may be uh, the result of, of previous injections because a lot of the lesions may be seen uh, along the dorsum, especially between the shoulder blades. It's not an area that you're going to get a lot of self-trauma. You don't see a lot of inflammation, similar to that in poodle patch or dermatomyositis. They're cell-poor vasculitis. Um, on biopsy, you will see atrophy of the adnexa, often a linear area of fibrosis, uh, along the bottom of the biopsy. It's not a psychogenic alopecia. Psychogenic alopecias are generally bilateral, um, and you look for evidence of hypersensitivity. So this is a very interesting condition that is seen in multiple species. Here is another fairly uncommon vascular-driven disease of dogs, which has gone by a number of names, including green track disease, Alabama rot, and now goes by the name thrombotic microangiopathy, although you might also see it referred to as cutaneous and renal vasculitis. It was first identified in Alabama in 1980 in greyhounds. But had, clusters of this disease have been seen in other uh, countries, such as Germany and the United Kingdom, as well. 
The cause is unknown, although uh, people have tried to uh, incriminate uh, sugar-producing E. coli, and it causes a thrombosis of renal capillaries and capillaries of the skin, which ultimately result in subcutaneous hemorrhage and shearing of red blood cells. Ultimately, the condition usually results in a consumptive thrombocytopenia, hemolytic anemia, and multi-organ failure. The clinical signs and symptoms do remind me a bit of porcine circovirus associated uh, nephritis and dermatitis syndrome, but no virus has been also isolated uh, out of this condition, so we're going to have to leave it in the immune-mediated diseases, at least for the moment. Here is a disease that has a very difficult name to pronounce, the Voigt Harada Koyanagi syndrome, which somebody thankfully renamed the UVO dermatologic syndrome. And it's usually seen in Akitas, Chows, and Huskies. Here is an affected animal. Here's one in the background saying, what the heck is going on with you? And I hope I don't catch that. This is a depigmenting syndrome in which histiocytes or macrophages are the effector cells. They attack cells with pigment. It usually starts in the eyes, because there's a lot of pigment in the eyes and the animals will develop a severe histiocytic endophthalmitis. Ultimately, macrophages will begin to attack pigmented cells in the skin. The animal will develop leukotrichia and maybe ulceration in areas where there are lots of pigments, such as on the nasal planum. Granulomatous inflammation in the skin and the eyes is the rule. And that's how it gets the name UVA from the uvea of the eye, uveo dermatologic syndrome. It does also occur in people, um, but there is uh, a meningoencephalitis associated with that that we don't see in dogs. It can also attack the middle and inner ear in people resulting in deafness. Once again, something we don't see in dogs, but the uh, uh, obviously the severe ophthalmitis and dermatitis can be ultimately uh, life-threatening in these dogs who are often put down uh, for humane reasons. Akitas, chows, and huskies. Let's move on to one of the more common or the most common autoimmune disease of the cat, and these are the lesions that are associated with the eosinophilic granuloma complex. There are actually three forms. I'm not showing the, uh, the indolent or rodent ulcer, a very poorly named disease, um, uh, which is probably the most common of the three. We describe that in the gastrointestinal system and also in diseases of cats. So feel free to, to review those lectures. The other two forms of uh, eosinophilic lesion that we see with the quote-unquote eosinophilic granuloma complex are the linear, the eosinophilic plaques and the linear granulomas. Um, the eosinophilic plaque, as we see here, is often seen back into the animal. They're large, red, weepy uh, plaques which, which cats will often lick. And uh, when you biopsy them, this is the one of the three that you are generally going to get the highest concentration of eosinophils in. The other two diseases, as they go farther along and become more chronic, the indolent ulcer and the linear granuloma, you tend to get a shift. The early lesions have a lot of eosinophils. Later on, you can biopsy the indolent ulcer, get nothing but lymphocytes and plasma cells, or in the linear granuloma, a lesion that very characteristically affects the uh, back of the thighs of cats. You get a lot of granulomous inflammation and fibrosis. See how these are contracting down. Um, but you don't get a tremendous number of eosinophils. Luckily, the linear granuloma is very characteristic in its location. 
another immune mediated disease of cats, something that we used to call pillow foot back in the day in practice uh, down in Georgia, um, but is known as plasma cell pododermatitis. In this, the pads of the feet, especially the metacarpal pad and the metatarsal pad, will become swollen and sort of soft and collapse, and they will develop this pattern of cracks in the surface, like the patina on a fine bronze statue or on really good china. And biopsies of these will reveal nothing but plasma cells. It may res be accompanied by a plasma cell stomatitis. And things that you want to think about when you see all these plasma cells or other possible clinical pathologic abnormalities such as hypergammaglobulinemia or changes that will be seen over time as a result of type 3 hypersensitivity reactions when all of these plasma cells that have produced antibody when it all uh, precipitates out into the vessel. So you want to look for immune-mediated glomerular nephritis uh, in these cats as well. These pads are much softer than the other ones due to the collapse and inflammation of the underlying uh, fat pad. These pads may occasionally become ulcerated, but they always have these characteristic stria or cracks. Um, this can be a seasonal problem that can spontaneously resolve and uh, you'll never see it again. Hey, here's a immune disease in a uh, laboratory animal species. This is one that's well known in rats. It's known as auricular chondritis, in which there is granulomous inflammation, which is directed primarily against the cartilage of the ears, given these uh, uh, ears sort of a cauliflower-like appearance. Uh, the cause has never really been known. It's been associated with a couple of different strains of rats, including brown hooded rats, but you can see them in, in uh, traditional uh, laboratory rats as well. It uh, originally was incriminated as uh, uh, when ear tags, metal ear tags were used in these animals and it was thought to, to cause this co condition, but uh, we don't use metal ear tags as much anymore and you still see the disease um, the presence of a, a big tag, uh, a, a traumatic wound in a foreign body in the middle of it may exacerbate the swelling, but probably is not the ultimate cause. And here's a great picture from Fabrizio Grandi again, um, showing a similar lesion in cats. Feline auricular chondritis is an uncommon lesion, but uh, it looks very similar to that which we see in rats. Moving on to horses, and we only have a couple of slides, so we're going to wind this up pretty quickly. There's a couple of immune disease. Um, type 1 hypersensitivity causes urticaria, and horses will commonly develop uh, urticaria as a result of various drug administrations, vaccines, uh, changes in their diet to include uh, high levels of grain. Um, some will develop hives after exercise or even scratching your fingernails down the side. Many causes, it rarely causes any significant problems to the horse. In severe type 1 hypersensitive reactions, you can get swelling of the intestinal mucosa with uh, severe constipation, but usually is not considered a significant problem in infected horses. Horses get a lot of lumps and bumps in their skin, um, which may be immune mediated as well. Here's a common one that is usually causes non-itchy, non-pruritic nodules on the dorsum of the back and over the withers. And this is known as equine nodular collagenolytic granuloma. It looks very much like eosinophilic granulomas in cats with uh, collagen degradation uh, resulting in brightly eosinophilic flame figures. Nobody really knows what causes it. People have thought that it might be an immune response to 
um, the silicone based coating of hypodermic needles but nobody sticks a horse this many times um, it may be the result of insect bites or trauma but something is setting uh, the immune system up to direct uh, against the collagen within these nodules it used to be called nodular necrobiosis but that's a terrible name um, for the condition not as crazy about collagenolytic granuloma but at least it's descriptive of what you are going to see on the uh, on the underside of the horse and the flanks usually around the girth something used to be called girth galls but uh, these are nodules of uh, amyloid uh, amyloid may be seen uh, as isolated nodules in the skin or in the nostrils the nares of the horse they're usually uh, uh, round firm non-painful um, they may regress spontaneously or they may just stay and pursue a chronic progressive uh, course nobody really knows um, what causes them and usually unless there are many um, in associating with where the saddle is put on or they um, are obstructing the respiratory passages through the nares. They're usually not of any uh, real significance. Finally, I'm going to end up with a, uh, a baffling puzzle of a disease in a particular strain of a black mouse. This is known as ulcerative dermatitis of B6 mice. And there's a lot of predisposing factors. It doesn't seem to be any one particular cause, but it's well known in, uh, along with people who are using laboratory mice. Um, and obviously, because it primarily hits the, the B6s, there is a genetic component. So it'll also be that these animals may have ectoparasite uh, hypersensitivity. And there have been a number of papers implicating uh, vitamin D or sorry vitamin A deficiency in the diet they these animals scratch and scratch they often um, get secondary bacterial infections uh, by staphylococcus and it's usually seen in uh, more often in females than in males and it's a seasonal disease with peaks in the spring in the fall and the midsummer ulcerative dermatitis of B6 mice. Okay. Well, that gives us a brief review of immune mediated diseases in animal species. It's not a complete list. Um, and I'm not a dermatopathologist, but uh, I do my best with uh, describing some of these conditions. When we come back next time, we're going to talk about a combination of the nutritional, the metabolic, and the toxic diseases that affect the skin of domestic animals. I look forward to putting together that lecture, and I look forward to having you join me. But until that time, once again, I wish you good health and have a wonderful day.